You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the book, Long Walk Up, Portia, Love for Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. It worked this morning. <laughs> I was a little nervous. Uh- I've had, I've had, I'm just talking to our, to our guest, Heather. Uh, 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 I, I was trying to put you on pause and I wasn't able to. So I'll, I'll let you know when I'm pulling you in. Uh, just to our off the shelf listeners, I was saying it worked this morning. I pulled our guest in early because there have been times when I don't hear that music kicking on. I know there's something wrong technology at Blog Talk Radio, and it's happened about three times over maybe the last two years. It doesn't happen often. But it has happened, and I think the show is taping, but it's not. And then when I asked them for the stream link, it's not there. So we are in business. We are in business. It's January the 20th, and I want to start with this quote. This for, again, our listeners, the best way to predict the future is to create it. I love that when we, we can keep, and I have to discipline myself, not to expect something magical. It's just going to happen one day, and my whole life's going to be different. I have to make create it. The best way to predict the future is to create it. I love that quote. For those of you who've been here with us for 18 years on Off the Shelf, thank you, thank you, thank you. If this is your first time tuning in, you're looking for something to do on a Saturday morning, I want to let you know that, yes, you absolutely are listening to the winning book podcast, Off the Shelf Books. And, again, welcome to this January the 20th show. We have a wonderful author on deck for you, and I learn, I always learn something from every guest, so I look forward to what today's guest is going to share. But before I get to that, I just wanted to, there is a book that I wrote, Heal Gorgeous, Wisdom Within You Knows the Way, and it's not a work of fiction. It's a work of poetic writings and short writings that really hopefully help you to awaken to what you really are, so you can go back and do like that quote said, the best way to predict the future is to create, and you had a power within you to actually create the life you want to live. If you if you, if you you like those light readings, there's another book, um, uh, there's one, uh, Bloom, and the author now has like these transformative trainings. There's another short story of a boy with two animals, and I forget what they are, and it's just taken off these books just take off because they really are the they they they're a gentle away a gentle awakening to just how awesome and amazing you are and heal gorgeous wisdom within you knows the way is available in ebook paperback and hardback and, and if if you, you value something like that i encourage you to get a copy of heal gorgeous wisdom within you knows the way today and now let us go and meet today's special off-the-shelf guest. And our special guest this morning is Heather Moore. Now, Heather is a USA Today bestselling author. Go, Heather. She has written more than 90 publications, writing mainly historical and her story books. She is a hybrid author, self-publishing some of her books, and having been published by traditional publishers such as Thomas & Mercer, Kinder Press, and Storyfront, Shadow Mountain and Covenant Communications. In addition to writing and publishing her books, Heather offers editing services through Precision Editing Group, and that website link is exactly as it sounds, Precision Editing Group, P-R-E-C-I-S-I-O-N-E-D-I-T-I-N-G-G-R-O-U-P.com. And awards Heather has won include the Whitney Award, Roan Award, Maggie Award for Best Short Contemporary Romance, and the Quill Award. Please check Heather Moore out online at, she kept it so simple, hbmoore.com, h-b-m-o-o-r-e.com. Again, that's h-b-m-o-o-r-e.com. We are just absolutely honored to have Heather join us on Off the Shelf this morning. Welcome to Off the, Sh- Off the Shelf, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, we're happy to have you. I was waiting. I was saying, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, the music didn't come on. 
<laughs> that was a little too early, but I'm glad that it did, and we're on our way this morning. Now, the first few questions I'm going to ask you, I ask every guest who comes on Off the Shelf, so our listeners can get a little backstory on the artist before we start talking about their books. So to kick off today's show, Heather, can you tell Off the Shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? Sure, no problem. Um, I was actually born in Providence, Rhode Island. My dad was attending uh, Brown University and working on his PhD in religious studies and New Testament in the New Testament. Um, and then we ended up in Utah, and I mostly grown up in Utah. Kind of a little bit unique about me is because of my dad's projects, we went to the Middle East a lot, and so I spent. Uh, first grade in Jerusalem and second grade in Cairo and then later on as a teenager we went back and lived in Israel again so I have I still have friends from all over the world who speak multiple languages I only speak English even though I I took different languages through high school I just I don't know maybe I have to be living in a country to really immerse myself um but probably one interesting thing about me is that I did not start writing until I was 30. And I always I always loved English in high school and creative writing, but I failed my AP English essay. So I felt like, oh, I, I should not major in English, so I didn't. I majored in fashion merchandising when I went to college. But I just have always, always loved reading. And I would go as a little kid to the library and I'd I'd always check out 12 books because that was the limit, and not that I would get through them all in a couple weeks, but I just loved to be surrounded by books. So it kind of felt like a natural segue when I started writing, but I never thought I would actually be published. I thought that writers were, you know, lived on, lived in L.A. or in New York, and and they wore, you know, nice clothing and nice suits and pearls and um I didn't think I could I could be that kind of person, but just little by little, I was able to finally get published. It took me about four years to get published. Oh, you never gave up. You never gave up, and that's good. Now, when you were a little girl, you traveled a lot, as you told us, with, with your dad and his studies and the projects he worked on. But what did you dream of being when you grew up when you were a kid? Well, I really loved to sew. I would uh, make my cats clothes. And I oh make my Barbie clothes. So I just, I don't know. I thought I'd maybe go into some sort of um, fashion design or even, I love to do things like quilts or, or something kind of more in the, the creative art side of it. Um, and I still love to do it, but now I have to wear reading glasses, so it's not as easy anymore to thread a needle. <laughs> Years, within years, and birthdays of birthdays. Now, you said you loved to read. You just loved to be surrounded by books when you were young, although you didn't start writing till you were 30 and took you four years to get your first book published. But when you, who or what inspired you to pursue writing? What, what birthed your love for books? Um, so one thing I remember is my mom, both of my parents are, are big readers. My mom would always have a book around. Um, And then I would spend um, maybe a week during the summer with my grandma, and she was always reading. She always had those good housekeeping magazines or read books, and they had little short stories in there, and I'd read those. And then she would give me um, books that she had read, like Victoria Holt, that she'd always rip off the cover, because even though they're not steamy romances, like the couple on the cover were always very amorous, and so she didn't like that, I guess. Um, you know, her her generation very conservative. And so I'd get these Victoria Holt books with the covers ripped off, and I would just get sucked into the story. And I was just surrounded by um, educators as well. My my dad is, he, well, he's retired. He was a professor, and my mother taught school. And my grandmother, um, she also taught school. She, uh, well, you know, she was born in 1906, so when she got engaged at the age of close to 30, she had to quit her job because back then um, married women didn't work. And so so she had a couple kids, and then she went back and got her teaching certificate. And when her youngest was five years old, she went back and taught first grade for the next 
30 or so years. So I was just surrounded by, I guess, um, women who, who loved their written word and who loved education. Okay. Now we want to switch into talking about your writings. Can you tell off-the-shelf listeners where the ideal for the Omar Zagori series came from? Oh, yeah. So I remember um, when I – so I kind of went through this phase of just reading a lot of thrillers. I loved international thrillers. I loved, like, uh, Tom Clancy books and John Gershon books. And I I just um, – I had spent time in some, either living in some of those countries or traveling in them. And so I was thinking, well, I don't want just to write, you know – a little romance or a beach book and I want to write something that's intriguing and complicated. And so that's kind of where that, that was born. The idea of trying to find, um, I, I love things that were just, you know, anything where you like a treasure hunt story. And so I felt like that was kind of feeding into that side of me that what I love to read. Um, of course now I do write sweet romance. So it's kind of ironic or in the beginning of, my writing career, I thought, oh, no, that, that sounds like um, I need to write something more complicated and with more depth in it. <laughs> ah, okay. So y- y- your curiosity in this, that's where the, the, the series in part comes from. Now, had you always planned to turn the story into a series? I know they're really big. It's a good way to increase your book sales. People want to know what's happening in the next, with the character, what's going to happen next. Had, was that yeah. your plan initially to have it be a series? And if so, why why did you take that approach? Um, I actually so for this specific book, the first book in the series is called Finding Sheba, and I had actually was about two hundred pages into the book, and I didn't have intentions of writing a series. I was just trying to see if I could write a thriller that could, um, you know, get published, find something I could get published, and. I thought, well, I, I need this guy. I need this guy that's like a treasure hunter, and he has to be an expert in antiquities. And so I created this character 200 pages into it. I'm like, wait, this guy is like the main character of the story. So I went back and I added him from the beginning of the story. And when that book came out, um, it actually, I actually call it my 10-year book from when I first started writing it. It's a book I was able to get an, an agent with, um, she shopped it for a couple of years. It never sold. And so I kind of took it back, and then I ended up getting it published with a, a small press in Idaho. And then it did really well on Amazon. And so I got the attention of a bigger publisher, Thomas and & Mercer. And, so once, and then by then I didn't have an agent anymore, and so I went and I got another agent um, when I got this contract offer. And so when that book was finally coming out, I was like, okay, this is like the real deal. I have a publisher, I have an agent, um, and I have this great editor that's making it stronger. And I thought, well, I want another book. <laughs> so, okay. you know, because sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's not easy. It's never easy necessarily to write a book. But if it's in the same series and um, readers who, who read thrillers and read suspense novels, they like to have connecting characters you know, whether it's like a detective or someone that's taking you from one book to the next. And and series is a good way to build your, your readership and get get more and more uh, book sales. Now, can you give us a synopsis of Finding Sheba? And is this the first book in the series? Yeah, so Finding Sheba is the first book in that series. Um, it's, about, it's about a guy that he is um, part Israeli, and he used to work for the Israeli government, but now he's kind of branched off, and he he goes around the world and he recovers stolen artifacts. And so, because of that, he gets sucked into some of these, um, you know, crime rings, I guess. And so, but the kind of the unique thing about about this series is is called the Omar Zagori series because he's the main character. Is that I have him dual timeline, and so you have. Omar tracking down this artifact that maybe um, like the finding Sheba, it has to do with the Queen of Sheba. And then we go back 3,000 years in time and we're, we go into her point of view, the Queen's point of view. So we're reading like what happened to her, we're in her head. And then the other timeline is Omar discovering these clues as we're also following her life. Oh, 
interesting. How much do you rely on actual history in the book? Um, I try to, I do a lot of research. Um, and so the historical part is, is fairly accurate as far as the main characters and the plot. Obviously, you're adding dialogue and emotion. But, um, but I try to stay as much to the history as I can. That must be a lot of work. But see, you 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 lived over in that area with your dad with his projects, and does it, does he like some of his work? Is that proof helpful? Because he's already got that work. Has that proof helpful, or his work not totally related at all to to the um, yeah, in any way to the? Yeah, I think it. I think it definitely sparked my interest. And my dad has actually been on some archaeology digs, and he worked for um, a museum. At, is a Coptic museum, which was an ancient religion. Um, it's a Christian religion. And so, like, we would go to – so I've been around all these, like, museums with, like, mummies in it and stuff. So I think definitely that sparked my interest. Um, but I did find an Egyptologist who was willing to read um, those, those books of the series and give me some expert feedback as well. Wow, look at you. Good for you. Now, can you introduce <laughs> our listeners to to Omar Zagori? What what is he like? What's his personality like? What's his family family background? What what drives him? Yeah, so uh Omar Zagori, he is um he's he's kind of one of those guys that that well, I wouldn't say he has a temper, but he's very spontaneous um and he's willing to take take risks and so he does have a girlfriend at the beginning but they're very on again off again um relationship and so he is he's and a lot of his work is kind of undercover so he's not able to have like a great relationship with his girlfriend because he has to keep so many things you know hidden or secret and so but he he's just the kind of guy he he does he might be unconventional but he is um trying to help and trying to recover these art- artifacts and trying to get um, the thieves, you know, arrested or whatever. And so he does, he values history and he values property. And so um, he's a little bit of a vigilante that way. Mm, now, who is after Dr. R- First of all, before I ask you this, can you <laughs> tell us about Dr. Richard Lyon? Omar, he's a little quick-tempered. He values history, artifacts, so there's something going on. We know right now that somebody's probably wanting to get some artifacts. But who, tell us about Dr. Richard Lyon before I ask you the next question. Yeah, so Dr. Richard Lyon, he's another character in this book, um, and he has a lot of expertise, and he also um, ends up um, being kind of like the educational side and the person that is helping or that Omar is, is looking at because Dr. The, you know, Dr. Lyon, he has um, connections that go way back in the past that can now come and like affect the future. And so, mm. and so they, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of a situation where you have a professor who has, has some knowledge, but it might be dangerous knowledge. Now, who would, don't give the story away. If you give it away, then don't answer. But who is after Dr. Richard Lyon of Brown University, and why do they want to silence him? Yeah, so it's an organization, and basically because um, uh, kind of the whole premise of the story is that in reality, in truth, um, there is no actual evidence that King David or King Solomon ever existed. Um, unless you believe in the Bible. But there's there's no, like, archaeological evidence. So there's nothing that's been dug up that said um, this proves that King David um, was a real king and this proves that King Solomon was a real king. Because when you have, when you, if you can prove it and you can say, yeah, the um, the Jewish people do have a claim to the Holy Land. But because there isn't that proof, then you have different religions. You have Christianity, you have Judaism, you have Islam, so they all have claim to Jerusalem because of their various religious beliefs. So at the beginning of the story, um, a tomb is excavated, and it's a tomb of a different king 
who also what who lived during the same time as King David and King Solomon. And so this new king was a contemporary. And so this throws like the whole like archaeological world into a tizzy because all of a sudden there's clues um, saying, well, maybe King David wasn't real or maybe King Solomon wasn't real. So then who gets to have um, religious claim to Jerusalem? And so that's why all of these, all of these um, tomb hunters are trying to find proof of either King David or King Solomon. And then a group of them go and try to, if they feel like if they can prove that the Queen of Sheba was real, then they can prove that King Solomon was real, and then they can prove the Bible is real, and then the Holy Land can stay, like, intact kind of thing. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I already asked you where you got the idea for the story. I know what you said, but now I feel like somewhere else. So you was it like something that you read in the news or something to come up with for Finding Sheba? Where did that, like, where did so the um, idea for this? specific story come from yeah I think I actually it might have been originally in a conversation I had with my dad when I was telling him I'm trying to find I'm trying to find something that can be discovered in the archaeological world that will that will kind of shake it up you know and because my dad would get like this the Saudi um Aramco like magazines and I'd read those magazines and it would be about the newest like digs and newest findings out there and so it might have just been something that that we were kind of brainstorming or that I was reading from those magazines um what a what a I mean the just the uh, the what, what's driving the story the the whole theme of it is very very intriguing now how pivotal is Mia Golding's role to unraveling the secret of the Queen of Sheba. And is she Omar's girlfriend? Yeah, so she's the one that um, has a relationship with Omar. And during the first book, they they aren't really friendly toward each other. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so she ends up working for for another organization that is also, has, is also trying to find evidence of the Queen of Sheba's tomb. And so they end up collaborating a little bit when they're forced to. So what's her is she is her role like super super key to the secret of the Queen of Sheba? Um, she's not she's probably not super key, but she does help uncover some of the things that Omar is trying to find. So um, she definitely is a, com- a companion that makes the plot go forward. And then I have to ask you, how much does she, is she, are they are they together physically? They're working together physically, searching for stuff, or are they like hundreds, thousands of miles apart? And just is she really a good historian, archaeologist, or is she just along because she knows Omar? Um, so she actually used to work as well for um, the same type of job that Omar did. That's how they met. But now they both work for different entities. Um, so they, they, they do um, they are in some of the same scenes, like when they go and they're actually in the tomb hunt scenes. She, they're in the same scenes together, so they definitely uh, cross paths. And what what have readers been saying about finding Sheba? Um, I think mostly it's been I've gotten a lot of positive feedback, um, so that also was why I decided to keep writing the series is Omar did end up becoming the main character as I completed the first book. And so the next books in the series, Omar carries that series through. And so because people really liked him, that they wanted to read more books and more, I guess, um, more adventures or tomb hunts from him. He wasn't initially supposed to be like the main character. That just happened as the book, after you, that wasn't your intent from the beginning? Right. I mean, he wasn't even in the first, my first half of the first draft. Whoa. (laughs) Interesting. What is happening at the start of Lost King, and is this the second book in the series? Yeah, so Lost King is the second book in the series, and it's basically um, kind of the same 
story format where you have a modern day search that involves Omar Zagori trying to uncover some information. And then you have a dual timeline where um, we learn about. So, so kind of the, the main story is that there's a prominent Egyptologist, Egyptologist that is murdered um, and, he, and also an artifact that he had uncovered, which is called the Book of the Dead, which is a real book from Egyptology. Um, but it's a complete version of it. And so that goes missing too. And so Omar is is assigned to go and figure out what happened to this artifact. Um, but we realize that that this Book of the Dead um, contains the Ten Commandments, which in Judaism and Christianity, the Ten Commandments came from God, you know, and so from Moses, giving, you know, Moses receiving them from God. And so now the world is like, wait a minute, if the Ten Commandments are in the Book of the Dead, did Moses really get the Ten Commandments? And so Omar goes on this this investigation, and then we go back a few thousand years in the timeline, and we're reading about a pharaoh, and the pharaoh is um, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, and this pharaoh was actually a woman, but... but um, after she died, her nephew destroyed all evidence of her. And so this is actually true, um, is this pharaoh was really a woman. And it wasn't until the 1800s that an archaeologist discovered the clues that, that told us she was a woman. Um, so anyway, so you're reading these two timelines, and this, and this pharaoh was the one that completed the Book of the Dead. And so kind of the mystery is, what does Omar got find out? Why was this Egyptologist murdered? And what is the artifact? What does it really show about the Ten Commandments? How much stuff do we believe? Because I just saw, I was reading another book that went, there were more feminine uh, years ago, and I'm going back thousands of years. Yeah. Wor- worship of feminine, and then somehow or another, all that was erased. And it was all—it was almost as if it was all ma- masculine. But the, it, the real history is like, no, it wasn't that way. And so now yeah. you wonder, how much stuff do we believe? Is—is is it really the way it was from the beginning, or is this just what somebody wants us to believe? And it's very interesting. Right. And it, and beliefs that people would fight over to the death. And we'll tell you, no, God said, and then you later. And I think I think that things will continue to surface that we'll see we were wrong about that, and 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 yep. to, and to have the courage to admit and accept we were wrong because a lot of people won't have the courage. No, 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 no. It can't be that way. No, you got proof in your face that it wasn't that way. Yeah. Now, <laughs> it, it's it's hopefully we will be able to. Because if we are awakening and going into truth, there are going to be a lot of lies we have to let go of. And will we have the courage, not just religious stuff, a lot of things we just believe that may not be true, even about ourselves right. as humans. It might not be true. Do we have the courage to let the untruth go? Or will we hold on to it thinking it will keep us safe? That's, that's Right. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Now, who who wrote the who wrote? The Book of the Dead. Was it the Pharaoh, female Pharaoh, who wrote it? It don't say answer nothing. They're gonna get a story away. But who wrote <laughs> it? And is the writing in it similar to what's found in the Quran or the Bible? Is the writing similar, or is it like I read the Dead Sea Scrolls and they read nothing like the the King James Bible? Nothing. Is, it, um, is the so writing look at the, similar, yeah. or is it different? Yeah, so the Book of the Dead is actually, is, is, I mean, I actually have two copies of it. I mean, not, you know, re, you know, modern copies of it. But, they, but it's a collection of religious texts and magical texts. Is Egyptians had a lot of, um, they, used, they used spells and prayers, and, and they, have, they had religious practices. And, and so it basically kind of goes through, like you said, like the different pharaohs and the different blessings and the different prayers they had in the traditions. 
And so it's it's just a collection, um, but it also it is during the time of Moses is some of these um, blessings and spells. And so, so I thought, well, if it's during that same time in Moses, you know, where, you know, because I remember, so, okay. So a little bit of a side note, I wrote a series on Moses. I have a three book series that I wrote about Moses and his basically, um, it starts when he's young and then when he takes the uh, children of Israel into the wilderness. And I remember on Twitter <laughs> a long time ago, Someone says something like I had said, oh, my book is out. And they said, oh, so is this fantasy? I'm like, it's not fantasy. It's historical fiction. They're like, well, it's it's only historical fiction if you believe in Moses. I'm like, well, doesn't everyone believe in Moses? And, of course, I know that's not true. But in my mind, I'm like, that was the – I just had never thought that someone on Twitter would question who Moses yeah. was. And so maybe it was just that little, like, seed was kind of in my mind. Like, well, not everybody thinks – that Moses did the Ten Commandments, and so maybe it could be in another ancient religious text. And so that kind of started the mystery portion of Lost King. And so the title Lost King is that the Pharaoh was a woman, and she really is a Lost King in history, is that is that her nephew just, he took down all of her statues and destroyed all of her writings and everything about her he could, um, so that she basically wouldn't exist anymore. Mm, and that's why a lot of that has gone on. Oh, my goodness. And everybody doesn't share similar beliefs. Everybody doesn't share. you. It's just this assumption, and we do it along gender, race, all kind of things. We think everybody that looks a certain way thinks alike, and they don't. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. They're like, they're just like totally, totally different. Now, can you tell us about, tell us one fact uh, or, or you did maybe you did with the Pharaoh being a woman that that Omar covers in Lost King that just would shock readers. I mean, is is that the one thing that I can only imagine people going, "What? I thought all the pharaohs were were male." That, yeah. Is there like anything else that readers were they're having a hard time accepting that it's I think that it's I factual. think you actually yeah you actually said it where where some of the leaders in these ancient times, they were women and, and they were covered up in history. So like even the queen of Sheba, like there's legends of her being part demon. Cause they're like, how could a woman rule Arabia? Yep. And so they said, well, she had goat feet and she had a tail, you know? And so like the same thing is this Pharaoh, this female Pharaoh is that um, I think it was, the 1800s is when they found out that she was actually a woman. And then I was reading just randomly, listening to on audio a, a couple months ago, another book about all the, the Egyptian dynasties and how when a pharaoh would take over, the previous pharaohs, like court, like his wives, his children, his advisors, they were all ritually killed. And wow. it was like an honor to be killed when your pharaoh died. And so when the new pharaoh took over, it was like a clean slate so that he would have, so everybody would be loyal to him and not loyal to the previous pharaoh or try to usurp the new pharaoh with like, you know, one of the, another son. And so I was like shocked to kind of realize that so many people were killed every time a new pharaoh took over. I almost sound like lions. <laughs> They yeah, right. <laughs> the, the only ones going to be here, the ones that from my seed. Now, is slave yeah. is is slave queen the last book in the series? And can you give us an overview of slave queen? So, slave queen queen is actually book three, and I have one more called the Killing Curse after that one. Um, so I so slave slave queen um, is it continues Omar's adventure so he continues in the main character and his girlfriend Mia is also in there um this one actually takes place in Turkey or the Ottoman Empire um and as a teenager I was able to visit Turkey on we're living in when we're living in Israel it was very close and so it's just like a spring vacation trip (laughs) sounds kind of funny um 
anyway, so so he basically has has kind of a mystery, another mystery to solve, which takes place in um, Turkey, where he finds out that there are these 16th century letters that reveal that the Sultan Suleiman, which was a real person, and his chief wife, Roxlane, which is a real person, um, that there's some letters that reveal this mystery. And so, um, and, and basically the descendants of this original Sultan, um, they're using this in order to like have control over um, their organization. And so, and so again, it's a dual timeline where you have Omar trying to figure out what is the truth behind these letters, and then you go back into the Ottoman Empire and you're learning about Roxlane, the wife, and the sultan. Is the fourth book out now, or are you working on it? Um, the fourth book is out. It's called The Killing Curse, and I actually ended up self-publishing that book because um, the publisher felt like this the series so sometimes when you write a series like the first book keeps selling really well but then the second third and fourth book like the sales are kind of on a downward slope um okay and so they had me write something else for them so i but i felt like i had to continue all my story because the readers were telling me what happens next so i i basically wrote the killing curse for the readers um and now I have people saying, well, we want, you know, we want another book, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> keep it going, because this story, <laughs> this story could go on. Do you, and I, I want to ask you a few, well, let me ask you a, a couple other questions before I ask you this one. Now, is the Ottoman Empire, is it based largely or loosely on historic facts? Yes. And it, can you share, like, two events in the books that are actually factual? Yeah, so the facts are that... Um, one is is so the the sultan he had multiple wives, but there was a chief. But when he chooses a chief wife, which it doesn't have to be his first wife, but the one that he gives the most honors to, that wife, um, her first son will become the next sultan. Um, so it's it's not really like a shocker that that that's the tradition, but the way it happens. Um, Probably I probably would give away part of the plot, but okay, the way that she that. becomes don't a chief that. wife, okay. yeah, is kind of like the oh, you know. <laughs> okay, it sounds so interesting. Now, does Omar? But okay, so when you describe the, uh, well, is it described in a way the reader will feel like they're back in that time, back in that physical setting? Do you describe it that way? And is that yeah, based so, on yeah. history? Yeah, so it's a dual timeline. So the Omar Zagori timeline, which is modern day, that's, you know, 90% fiction. But when you go to the second timeline, where we're in the Sultan's point of view and his wife, Roxlane. Um, so that is based on true history. Mm, I love that about historic novels. Now, does Omar find what he's seeking by the end of Slave Queen? If 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 it won't give us story, you um, can say yes or yeah. no. Does he find what he's seeking? Yeah, it has a good ending. The thing about Slave Queen is that it's more personal for Omar because it's actually connected to his ancestors, and so it becomes Whoa. kind of a personal um, suspense plot. <laughs> Does he know this? Does he know this, or is this something he discovers? Like, oh, I'm related to this person. Does he know this when he yeah, starts? He, his search? Yeah, he discovers it like part way through the book. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. It, I can see why readers would want more. Now, this is what question I had initially when I was researching for your interview plan to ask, but I want to. This is a story I see could be a movie. Have, when you wrote it or before you started writing it, did you ever concept it as a TV series or? Uh, uh, maybe three major motion pictures. Did you ever see it like in a movie form in your head uh, when you were creating it or when you thought of it? Yeah, I think I think a lot of times um, when I'm writing, his, you know, like a book, and obviously um, the fantasy would be different, but like when it's historical fiction, I think this is like a cool story. It's based on true history that could be bring you know brought to life. 
in a movie format because it it just it just it takes over a different part of the creative process where I love to read books, but I also like movies based on books, even if they don't totally follow the book, because I feel like it's just another creative interpretation, which I can enjoy both equally. Um, I think it was probably more like the first book with Finding Sheba. I feel like that was even more applicable to what was going on in the archaeological world. So I thought it'd be, it would make a you know, really fun kind of tomb hunt adventure movie. And there's some out there, of course. Um, but I think there could be more. Mm, this story really <laughs> sounds intriguing. I'm telling you, so, so intriguing. And it, it bears the question, especially with uh, the archaeology, that a lot of things we just take, we believe, we have no evidence of it. We just keep repeating stuff, and we believe it. And it might not even be true. It's just shocking. I sit there and wonder just how many things do I believe that might not even be true. It's it's really shocking almost, just absolutely shocking. Now, you also write women's fiction, historical fiction, inspirational books, and more. And I love the yeah. cover for The Slow March of Life. Is this story based on real-life events? Yeah, so this is a very interesting book to write. So I actually got to interview the man that the book is, the book is based on. Um, his name is Bob Inama, and he had served in the military. He was drafted into the military in the, 1959, and he ended up in West Germany, and this is during the Cold War. So you have East Germany and West Germany divided from each other. The Soviets controlled East Germany, and the Allied powers France, UK, and America controlled parts of West Germany. And so Bob goes into this um, military service in the Army, and he ends up getting asked to go as an undercover spy into East Germany, and he's asked to photograph locations of where the Soviets keep, like, weapon arsenals, and they have, like, um, different military bases in the event of a nuclear war. So... Bob is sending back these coordinates to the U.S. government and saying, if there is a nuclear war, you guys will know where you can target the Soviets. And so this was this is what Bob had dealt with, um, and then he ends up getting caught. Um, and so when I met Bob, he was in his 80s, and he had given my publisher permission to write his book as a historical novel, and so I can obviously add in and embellish um, to his story. Um, but he would give me, like he basically sent me like about 12, a 12 page short bi- biography. And so I could like, that was like the starting place. And then as I researched the cold war, I would email him questions every week and he would send them back. And then that's how I framed the story. Um, and so it's very, very interesting. Um, Bob is, is a guy who he he ended up being in prison for six months um, in a Soviet prison in East Germany, and he was beaten every single day. Um, and when he came out of there, when he was he was actually traded for another prisoner. That was kind of common is when the Soviets would trade prisoners with the U.S. and they would kind of go back and forth. And so he got traded for another prisoner, and he had some brain damage, and so he had to be in a hospital for at least a month. And after the Army, he had wanted to become a lawyer, and they told him that his brain probably couldn't recover enough to become a lawyer and go through, like, all the schooling that would take. So he ended up teaching school in Idaho, and he taught political science, and he just lived kind of a very quiet family life the rest of his life. Um, and it was um, in 2019 when his grandson had a project to interview someone that had been in the military. And Bob told us, wrote down all of these answers to all these questions that nobody in the family knew about. So he had never told his parents or his sister or anyone in his family that he had been in a Soviet prison. And so all of a sudden this story came out. So his son-in-law was like, what? What happened? You know? we can't believe you went through this. And so they sent a letter to my publisher and said, my dad has this amazing, like, survival story. And then that's how it ended up getting me to write it. Oh, my goodness. 
does the does the title hold a special meaning? The slow march of light. So the title um, comes. I actually didn't choose the title. The editor um, who read the book first, he said, "I know your title," and it's a scene when he's in prison, and there's a um, there's a small window that's 15 feet above the ground. And in Bob's point of view, the only way he can track time is seeing the slow march of light, like moving across the the prison wall. Oh, my God. Did he know Louisa before he went in? So Louisa, she is, um, to explain her, her, her name is made up. And when I was talking to my publisher about plotting the book out, they said, we want to have a female counterpart to Bob. And so I remember asking Bob, I said, Bob, did you have a girlfriend? Did you have any women that you're friends with? And I know you're happily married now, but I just I want to know. Um, so he told me there's a, there's a woman, there's a German woman who went to his same church, his Christian church in Frankfurt. And, um, and he said they, were, they would go to the socials together and the dances together, but... Um, he knew that they couldn't have a romantic relationship because her father hated Americans and obviously because they're German and their country is now occupied by Americans. And so Bob was just that kind of guy who was just very respectful. Um, and so the first part of the book where we have Louisa beating Bob in, Germ- in Frankfurt and they have, um, you know, a lot of interactions like at, at the church socials. Um, so that is all based on truth. But then once Bob goes to Berlin and Louisa also moves to Berlin, that part is all fictional. So he never wow. saw Louisa again in real life after he went after he went undercover as a spy. Oh my god. You oh my god, the story the story the plot your stories are so interesting. Now you which one of your books and congratulations was a USA Today bestseller? Which one I mean they all sound fabulous. Um, yeah. So I actually have um, five books that became USA Today bestsellers, and oh my goodness, um, one of them, yeah, one of them was this was a book. It's called The Healing Summer, and it's set in the '80s, and it's about a woman in her 90s who is trying to find the man that saved her life during the San Francisco earthquake, and so it's kind of like she is trying to 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 heal her past and all these questions she always had. Um, and so she takes a road trip with her neighbor and they go to San Francisco and they, they try to find the man that had saved this woman's life. Anyway, so that was one of the books that was the USA Today bestseller. And I actually um, self-published that book too. So that was kind of fun. Awesome. What was that like when you first learned? Did you get a letter in the mail? Did you, how did you learn an email? What was that experience like when you um, the very first time? Yeah, so basically, um, the so like say your book comes out January first, and so that that week you have a week to sell and hopefully promote your book as much as you can to get numbers in, and then after that week is done, um, the next I think it's the next Wednesday night they post they post the list, and so you can see. Um, if you made the list, and then Thursday it gets like published to the to the newspaper USA Today, and so you basically just are on pins and needles, checking when the list gets posted, and then it and the list is at the top 150 books across the nation, um, no matter the format, it could be ebook, paperback, hardcover, audio. Um, so it's the it's the sales combined, and so if you are self published. Um, you can you can get on the list if your sales are hard and high enough. Um, you know, there's other lists, of course, like the Amazon charts and New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Um, so there's other lists, but I haven't been able to get on those lists yet. <laughs> yeah, you have what probably knock out what at least ten twenty thousand in one week. That's a lot of books. Yeah. So for the USA, so for the USA Today list. Um, and on and I'm not 100% sure what it is today because it's been a couple of years since I've made it, but it, you had to sell like around at least 6,000 minimum to get in just on the list. But obviously, the more you sell, the higher 
your rank. Yeah. Oh, well, impressive. Congratulations. Now, you are Thank a you. prolific writer. You, uh, do you think, we have about 10 minutes left, but do you think a writer, I've heard this a couple of years ago, People, uh, so many people have books. Amazon must, I think, have over 30 million books on Amazon. I, I really believe that now. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, everybody has some there a lot of people are in it just to make money. They really don't aren't a writer. And from blank journals to coloring books to quizzes to AI generated books yep. to novels to people just in it pouring out books to hopefully make a lot of yeah. money. But do you yep. so it's 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 making it tougher for your book to get noticed. I don't care where you publish it now. Do you think a writer needs to be prolific? to earn a full-time income writing and pub- publishing novels today? Yeah, I definitely think that, um, I, I mean, there's, there's ways, obviously, if, if, you have, if you're with one of the big five publishers and that big five publisher decides to make you like their A-list author, then you can definitely make um, good money that way. Um, the tricky thing with writing and publishing, as, as you know, is like, is when you write the book, you, you write the book in 2023, you turn it in and it gets accepted in 2024. It may not come out till 2025. And then and if you have an advance, that's great, but you don't actually earn money until 2026. Yep. And so you're writing like two or three years in advance. So, so, so if you, if you do self publish, then it's, then obviously time to market is a lot faster, but then you're responsible for all the publication costs, you know, paying for the editor, cover design, and then all the marketing, all the marketing falls onto your lap. And even when you traditionally publish, you still have to do a lot of marketing. I mean, I follow authors that I really, you know, that are huge sellers. They've been on the New York Times list multiple times, and they're like constantly marketing on Facebook and Instagram. Yes. You know, and so you just see that everybody is doing it. Like you said, it's so congested. It's so competitive. Yes. Um but I do feel like readers, they don't read one book a year. They're, there's voracious readers out there that are reading several books a month. And so it's your job to kind of tap into those readerships and to gain a following. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of the marketing tricks out there. But, but once one marketing trick works, everybody does it. And then you have to find something new to do. <laughs> so I'm grateful you, for you for having me on this podcast because it's something that I can share with my readers and and it just kind of helps everybody as a whole. Yeah, when you do a podcast, it, it can just go, you can put it on your website, you can link it, you can just keep using different podcasts. You can you can use yeah. bits of it to, 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 to drive a, a one marketing point home or it's just so many things, and you can use it, leverage it to get even more interviews. Uh, I, when I first came out, I was doing radio interviews, laughed and right. It it is it is very helpful. You talked about some marketing tricks once people, want, but but one thing you did mention, and I would encourage our off the shelf listeners who are writers who want to be a writer, is that you have to find your your readers, not just going out to just anybody. But if you yeah. can build a following, that's how people like Stephen King, uh, uh, Terry McMillan, Toni Morrison when she was still here, Maya Angelou, there are people who, and there are actors and actresses who do that. If you say so-and-so's in a movie, boom, they're going to go see it just because yeah. that person's in it. And some people, if you have your following, they will buy your book simply because you wrote it. No other yeah. reason. They, they, You have your reader, you're developing there are people who buy Stephen King book. I don't care what it's about. He wrote it, and they'll <laughs> buy that book once you get your following. So, are there, can you share like we we got about five minutes? Just two to three other marketing uh, again for our listeners who are writers. Uh, marketing tips that you could share that could help them sell more copies of their books. Yeah, I I feel like kind of what I've done since um, obviously in 2020 it was a rough year for marketing because. Um, I was I was releasing a book called The Paper Daughters of Chinatown, and I was with a new publisher for me, Shadow Mountain, and they have they are affiliated with bookstores all over Utah. And so normally I would have gone 
and did all these book signings and tried to do speaking events. And so we came up with the idea of, of doing book clubs. And so, and I've continued doing that. So now I'm like three and a half years into, I do a lot of online book clubs. You know, you can do Zoom is really easy. Um, if it's local, I can go in person now. But I just have really tried to hit the book club market. And that's something I had never really done before except for sporadically. But now because of of everything being in lockdown in 2020, people are not afraid of technology. And so people will say, oh, let's, let's do Zoom or let's do another, you know, online platform and you can speak to my book club. So I, so I put that in my newsletter. I say, invite me to your book club. Um, and I put that on my Facebook page and my Instagram page, invite me to your book club. And it, and it gives, and I like it because it does take time, obviously out of my schedule. And obviously sometimes at seven to eight o'clock at night, I'm like, okay, I got to put on some mascara, you know, and, and look <laughs> like I'm alive here. Um, but it, it gives that personal contact, that personal connection that you really don't get a lot because even on Facebook and Instagram, there's so much noise on there. And even with a newsletter going right to their, their inbox, they may not read it. You know, they might, they may stay a subscriber, but they're not reading it. So that's like one little niche I've worked hard on. The other one is collaborating with other authors that write in similar genres. And maybe we do an anthology together or maybe we say, hey, if you put my new release in your newsletter, I'll put your new release in my – so we're like cross-promoting back and forth. And we might interview each other on Facebook or Instagram, or we might do a joint giveaway. And so, okay. that, so that's kind of what I've done, yeah. Now, we are coming down to the wire, but I definitely wanted to talk about uh, – tell us about the services you offer through Precision Editing Group. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, my husband, um, he was in the software sales industry, and so he went through different companies, and there's like a lot of layoffs, and there's just a lot of stress with jobs. And so I thought I would do something on the side. So I do freelance editing, um, and we just offer, mostly we we work with indie authors or self-published authors, but we also work with authors trying to find an agent or trying to get a publisher and just get their manuscript to a higher level so it can get noticed and hopefully you get a publishing contract. Okay, so you so, so you yeah. You basically focus on developmental and line editing? Yeah, definitely. Yep, exactly. Okay. And how long have you been how long have you been doing precision uh editing group and do you find is that taken away from your writing or no? Um so I've been doing it for about I think it's been 15 years now, um, and definitely when I was just when I was made, when I had one publisher, I was doing a book a year. I was doing more editing, but now I have multiple contracts a year, and so I take on editing myself, kind of rarely depending on the project. But I have a group of editors that work for me, um, and yeah. they're all freelancers. And so I, and so my whole thing is I want to match the project with the right editor, and sometimes I don't have the right editor if I feel like because I like my editors to be well-read in that genre, like if it's middle grade or or high fantasy or something. Um, but I also have different connections with different freelance companies, so sometimes we, we refer each other back and forth, depending on the project. I'm seeing more and more writers doing that. I'm seeing more yeah. writers with either editing or a story development, some concepts in the story. I've seen more and more writers doing that um, t- uh, today. Oh, my goodness, Heather Moore, I so enjoyed you. <laughs> oh, my goodness, what a treat. What a treat. We have come to the end of the shelf listeners of today's show. I had more questions I wanted to ask Heather, but we always run out of time before I get to the, all the guest questions <laughs> and we did with her as well. We have just been... I know that you. We've had New York Times best-selling authors on, and now we have a, another five books. You would say today best-selling author, and that's quite the accomplishment. She has more than ninety publications, and she runs Precision Editing Group. Which, if you're interested in working with her, is spelled the way it sounds: Precision PrecisionEditingGroup.com. Her website is HBMore.com. H-B-M-O-O-R-E.com. 
Heather Moore. And you heard her stories talking about her book series and how intriguing and interesting her stories are. Go check her out, and you can learn more about her books and, and support her uh, her through her books, or whether you get it at Amazon, a bookstore, ebook, or print. And then if you're looking for editing service, you can hit her up at Precision Editing Group and see if there's there's a fit. To our off-the-shelf listeners, thank you so much for being with us. This Saturday, whether you're over at iTunes, there's so many places people catch off-the-shelf books from around the globe. Thank you for being here with us. Please come back next Saturday. Remember, just mark it on your calendar. Just mark it on your calendar. Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you're going to catch off-the-shelf books where you can just learn and introduce yourself to these amazing authors. Heather, thank you so much for being such a fabulous guest. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will send you, you a link so to much. the show. <laughs> I will send you a link to the show when it finishes streaming. To our listeners, as I always tell you, you are awesome. You are incredible. You are amazing. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye for now.